Thank you and welcome. I'm really excited to be here today sharing with you about this topic, the science of channeling. First, we'd like to thank our funders of some projects we've already done in this area. Couldn't do this work without them. So first, I'd like to share with you a little bit about my background. I'm a naturopathic physician, and I've been in private practice for a number of years and have been focused on mind-body medicine. I'm also a meditation teacher and have been teaching meditation for over a decade. I have a master's in clinical research, and I ran numerous clinical studies for over a decade before coming to IONS. In that decade, I worked with combat veterans with PTSD, stressed older adults, and dementia caregivers. I got a grant from the National Institute of Health on how mindfulness meditation works. In the lab, I've stressed people, I've relaxed people, I've collected measures like pupil dilation, blood pressure, brain waves, heart waves, skin conductance. I've collected saliva, blood, and urine. I've been on governmental grant panels and institutional review boards. I've written numerous papers and presented at conferences internationally. So why am I telling you all this? Besides, of course, to establish my credibility as a scientist. Well, nowhere in my academic background is there anything about channeling. So how did I end up standing here today to promote a channeling research program? What's the connection? Well, what you wouldn't know from looking at me is that I come from a long line of channels. I actually went to my first seance when I was 10 years old at my grandparents' house. You also wouldn't know that every single me member of my mother's family has channeling ability, from my grandmother, who surprised everybody by going into a full trance at 15 years old, to my uncle, who was tested for psychokinetic skills at John F. Kennedy University and channeled a book through automatic writing to my mom, who you'll get to experience today. Well, through many synchronistic events, I'm now at IONS with the freedom to use my research skills to explore important research questions about channeling. I'm ex incredibly excited and grateful to be here with you today. So channeling's been known for a long time, from the Delphi Oracle in Greece, to Moses, to the Virgin Mary and Muhammad. In fact, many of our world religions were founded on channeled prophecy or messages. Fast forward now to the present in the Western world. We have well-known figures like Edgar Cayce, Esther Hicks, and TV shows like The Long Island Medium and Monica the Medium. So if there's such history and interest, then why hasn't there been more research on it? Maybe because it's taboo or there are inherent biases towards it, or maybe because it's actually very difficult to study. It's probably a little bit of all of these. Of course, some research has already been done, but many of the studies have been small or used questionable scientific methods. Only recently has there been more rigorous research but there's a need for a lot more. So what is channeling exactly? I'd like to use this umbrella definition. Channeling is the communication of information to or through a live human from a source other than the physical as we know it. This umbrella term contains words like medium, channel, and psychic, we could actually talk for hours about the differences between these terms and what people think they mean. But for brevity's sake, I'd like to leave that for another time. So what are the important research questions that need to be asked about channeling? We've chosen six that define our long-term comprehensive research program. And I'll now go through each one of these questions in more detail. So first, what do we already know from the published literature? What do we already know from unpublished resources? How common is channeling and what are its characteristics? How does channeling work? Can we verify the information? 
and what makes a channel a channel. So first, what do we already know? What is the state of published literature? What we'd like to do is conduct a systematic review collating all published data. Our team will comb through all the literature to synthesize what has already been done. A similar review was just published, but it was limited in that it only used 19 studies that were published between the year 2000 and 2015, and they only got information from mediums who worked with deceased humans. Our systematic review will be much more comprehensive. Much of what we know about channeling is not actually published. To capture these resources, we'll invite experts in the field to a meeting where we'll discuss what they know about channeling and their recommendations for the next steps in researching it. The next essential question in our research program is how common is channeling? It seems like every time I mention channeling to someone, they have an anecdote to share about themselves or someone close to them. How many of you or someone you know have had a channeling experience? I believe that channeling may actually be a lot more common than we imagine, but we need to test that belief. So what we'd like to do is conduct a large cross-sectional survey to answer this question. The first phase will be to collect data from English-speaking countries. In the second phase, partner institutes will translate and administer the survey to countries globally. From this data, we'll understand how common it is, also what the experiences look like. For example, when did the channel begin channeling? Well, how old were they? Are they a conscious channel or do they go into a, a trance? And what is the source of their channeled information? We actually have some preliminary data on this. We asked questions of over a thousand meditators from all around the world about channeling-like experiences. We found that at least 60% of them had contact with non-physical entities during or just after meditating at least one time. 26% had this happen many times. 56 of the meditators had clairvoyant or telepathic experiences during or just after meditating at least once. And 24% had this happen many times. Our larger survey will tell us if this is high in, in these meditators or if it actually matches the general population. So our next question is how does channeling work? We will bring channels into the lab and collect various measures in our state-of-the-art laboratory before, during, and after channeling. We'll collaborate with other institutes for measures we don't have, like neuroimaging. This will allow us to see any changes in the channel's physiology specific to the process of channeling. We've already begun small efforts on this question. Arno DeLorme and Dean Radin have conducted a number of studies on this. One study they published sh showed brain changes associated with mediumship activities, meaning that when the mediums were actually collect, um, tuning into information, their brain waves were different compared to the control tasks that they did. We'll expand on these efforts by testing a larger number of channels with varying types of ability. Another important to ask is whether the information we receive is actually true. Again, Arno and Dean have already begun work on this question. With the same six mediums, they tested whether the information channeled about deceased humans was accurate using triple blind methods, which is the most rigorous testing that we have today. The final essential question to ask about channeling is what makes a channel a channel? Are there defining characteristics that distinguish them from non-channels? For this question, we'll compare a group of channels or cases to non-channels or controls and look at a number of markers to see if there are any differences between the two groups. The more people we evaluate in this study, the more refined we can get on defining the signature. 
For example, with 10 to 20 channels, we may discover a core or foundational signature for the ability to channel. But with 50 to 100 channels, we could discover the signatures of specific skills beyond the core ability, like remote viewing versus clear audience versus full trance channeling. The implications of answering this research question is profound because it would allow us to identify channels and also potentially enhance the talent. So in summary, here's what we want to do for our long-term channeling research program. We'd like to conduct a systematic review of the published literature. We'd like to have an invitational meeting with experts in the field. We'd like to conduct a global cross-sectional survey. We'd also like to bring channels into the lab to see how it works and if the information is accurate. And finally, we'd like to run case control studies to see what makes channels unique. So after hearing about this comprehensive program, you might be thinking, well, so what? Why is it so important to do this research? Well, I offer you this. Considering the fragile state of our world today, we need all the help that we can get. Channeling is an umbrella term for getting information from beyond our normal physical sources. And there's evidence that at least some of it is real. So doesn't it make sense that we should find out as much as we can about how people do this, where the information comes from, if it's accurate and how to identify and enhance the talent? And going even further, doesn't it make sense that we want to answer the most deep-seated questions that most humans have? Is there life after death? Does our consciousness exist beyond the death of our physical bodies? We may be able to answer these questions with this research program. We are in a unique position at IONS because not only do we have an amazing research team that has the skills and experience to successfully do rigorous research on channeling, but we also have the courage to ask the questions and dare to discover the answers. Thank you.